All right, speaking of serious, 1 John chapter 3. So you know it'll be serious. 1 John chapter 3. We're going to cover uh, hamartiology. That's, again, the doctrine of sin. So we covered a few, of, a few doctrines on that. Now we're going to cover another one, and that's called the seriousness of sin. The seriousness of sin. What we're covering today is not just sin itself or how it came to be, where it came from. We're going to talk about why it's completely serious. If we're going to be totally honest, if you especially live in this Bay Area, it does not make sense why Christians can be a little bit stuck up. Don't you think so with their standards? I mean, when you came to this church, you heard pastor telling you some shocking news when you were dating someone that you shouldn't live together, and that came like a big shockwave to you because something like that's been normalized. However, we have to understand that in God's book, things like that is just the tip of the iceberg where God says that's not allowed and that is sin. Now, it's hard for us to comprehend that because of the culture and the time we live in. It's about time we get out of that and enter God's culture and God's time. See his point of view. By doing that, then we can understand why sin is very serious. Let's look at 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. The first section we'll cover is sin is violating God's law. Sin is violating God's law. And I'd like the uh, camera people to see if the angle is correct. I'm going to stand there and then uh, just let me know. So we see right here that sin is violating God's law. That's just the clear, simple, basic definition. There are three ways that can be defined that clarify more about the nature of sin. Notice that one thing's very important. It's a violation of not man's law, moral law. It's God. That's a huge difference. The reason why people don't see their actions as sin and they'll argue to you that everything is relative is because, see, they deny God. When you believe morals are relative, what you've done is you got rid of God. Relativity gets rid of God, puts him out of the picture, no God. Now think about this. When there is no God in relativism, then anything goes with your rules. You can make up your moral codes. That's why in this culture, it's not sin when you're dating someone or someone you're interested in that you live together. After all, wouldn't that be the healthier option to understand your partner better before you do a big decision like marriage by practicing marriage first? See, that's the moral and humanistic understanding. But that's not the moral way of God's ways of doing things. So we have to understand what defines sin is God's law, not your law and not my law and not our feelings. Right. Feelings contradict anyways, your feeling and my feelings. So if that dictates to you what feels right, then no wonder in this society there's so many fights going on, division, chaos, because everybody's going by their feelings. If you look at verse 4, verse 4, the word of God reads, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin, see that, is the transgression of the law. That's the whole basic definition and explains why sin is extremely serious. Now we're going to go to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. How serious is it when you break God's law? It's so serious, if you break one, and I don't care how small it is, then automatically God sees you as breaking the entire law. Look at James chapter 2, verse 10 through 11. Notice that the word of God is very clear. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, so aren't you good enough if you kept everything in the law, and yet it's just one that you missed out. 
shouldn't you be recognized as one who kept the law pretty well? No, in God's standard, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. Very reasonable. The author argues just because you can't keep one part of the law, but you break another part of the law, doesn't mean that you keep the law. You're still a law breaker. People's got to get that in their minds. So when we think about sin, it becomes serious now. If we say you're a sinner or you've sinned against God, how serious is it? So serious that uh, if you offend one point, you're considered to be a person who broke the entire law in God's eyes. You might say that's pretty extreme, but see, that's God's standard. He's not seeing 1% sin, 99% perfection. Do you understand? He only, he only sees 100%. That's all he's seeing. You get rid of that digit zero at the end in some way or form, you get rid of 100. So you get rid of God's perspective of what perfection keeping the law means. See that? You have to see it at that standpoint. You might say, why? Because simple, God is perfect. You're not. So he cannot be God then if he breaks it. Now go to Acts 15. Acts 15. These two verses, James chapter 2, as well as Acts chapter 15, should convince anyone that no matter what they try to do in keeping God's laws, God believes that no one can keep the whole law, that they're still lawbreakers. So if people think they're good enough to go to heaven and they kept God's law pretty good, these two verses will prove once and for all no one can keep the whole law. These two verses will prove everybody is a lawbreaker. It doesn't matter if you, you're better than a murderer. A murderer broke the law as much as you, who maybe cheated just a little bit, lawbreaker. You're both considered lawbreakers. Acts chapter 15, verse 5. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which had believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved, even as they. This passage is the number one passage that you want to use to prove that only trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, salvation by faith alone can save you. No matter what you do to keep the law, the Bible says there's no difference. Everybody broke the law. No one can keep it. This verse is full proof of that. Think about it. If you put a little uh, puncture in the window with a pellet gun, it doesn't matter that a small hole will just ruin the entire glass itself. It doesn't matter how small you make the hole, right? Why? Because holiness is that fragile. It's that clean. It's that perfect. That it doesn't matter how small the hole is, you just ruin the whole window. Well, it's a big window, and it's such a small hole. Why do you have to get rid of the whole window? Why do you have to make a big deal out of it? It makes a big deal, especially if that window is a picture glass window. That'll ruin the whole picture itself. Why? Because that's how sacred, perfect, detailed, intricate God's holiness is. We don't treat it that way, do we? Now go to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. The next section is sin is committed by everyone. Sin is committed by everyone. 
You'll notice uh, when we return to that electronic whiteboard some other definitions of sin where it is a violation of God's law. It specifies further that God's the one who defines what's right and what's wrong. See, so that disproves relativism. That does away with relativism. You're not the one who defines it. Your feeling does not define it. Your cultural point of view don't define it. God's the one who defines it. That means, in an absolute sense, there is never anything God can do for which he needs our forgiveness, which is a very powerful line right there. Now, isn't it amazing that this relativist thought now makes us accusing of God for sin, accusing God of being unfair, accusing God of not meeting our standards. That's what happens when you get rid of God's standard and definition. I like this other quote concerning the seriousness of sin. Christ's blood reveals the seriousness of our sin. We insurrected the king. We defiled his glory. We deserve his wrath, and Christ absorbed it. How you understand the seriousness of sin is see how Jesus Christ was tortured on the cross. Murder you take as a serious sin, right? That you would get the death penalty, but people do that away now, and they'll put them life in prison. Well, didn't you know Jesus Christ received a worse execution than a murderer? He was tortured. He was beaten. His beard plucked out, shed every last drop of his blood. That water gushed out. That shows how God takes sin seriously. He doesn't really see it just as simply murder. He sees sin as something more brutal than murder itself. If you want to know how serious sin is, then just think about how Jesus bled and died for you and was tortured. That shows God anger. See, his anger, his wrath against sin. So you think he would hesitate to damn a soul forever. It shows his anger and wrath. We have to realize and understand how serious violating God's law is. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. Sin is undoubtedly committed by everyone. We're going to see the serious weight of sin, and it's proven that all have sin. No one is an exception. How many people have you tried to witness and tell them that they've sinned or they are undeserving of heaven and they'll look at you strange and they'll think that they're a good enough person and they don't think that they're a sinner? Well, these verses will prove once and for all that they have truly sinned. And these are the best verses that you want to mark down. 1 John 5, 17, 17. This is one of the top ones. All unrighteousness is sin. What does that mean? Anything that is not righteous. You ever ask yourself that? Well, I don't know if that thing is sin. Well, can you call it holy? What you're watching, what you're hearing, what you're saying, what you're doing. Can you call it righteous and holy? If you can, sin. That's something, right? See how serious sin is? James 4, James 4. If we feel prone to be normalized by the culture that we live in today, then let us remind ourselves what God thinks sin is by looking at these verses. James chapter 4, and then uh, verse 17, another powerful verse. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him, it is sin. What is also defined as sin is not just doing something that's wrong or unrighteous, something that you can't confidently call righteous, but something where you fail or neglect to do something good. Where you fail or you neglect to do something good. A lot of times that's going to change your thinking when... You do something and you neglect it or you skip it. It's not a sin, but is it something good that you skipped? Is it something good that you, neglect, you neglected? If that's a yes, then that verse says, if you know it to, 
to be good and you don't do it, sin. So maybe, yeah, you should talk to the brother and sister in fellowship with that person. Maybe you'll have to do it something like that far. If that's a good thing to do and you neglect to do it. All right, let's look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 28. Matthew chapter 5. In verse 28, is it a good thing to have manners? Then, if you don't do it, sometimes you have to ask yourself, I wonder if that's sin then. See, you have to keep making some rules and redefine sin to you. Bring up a lot of examples on doing good. What are good things that you don't do? Think about every good thing that you don't do, and then you'll realize that list can be pages long. And then you'll realize how much of a rotten sinner you are. All right, Matthew chapter 5, verse 28. This is very powerful too. The Bible says, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now, There's a standard routine from some preachers where they'll use the Ten Commandments as a soul win. And then when they do the Ten Commandments, they'll point out to the person, let's see how well you follow God's standards. Ten, all right? And then they'll bring up several examples. And one of them is do not commit adultery. And then the person will say, well, I never committed adultery. But then they'll turn to this verse. Did you ever lust? Did you ever lust? See, you don't have to commit adultery. But if you lust, then the Bible automatically counts that as adultery in the heart. And then people, when they hear that for the first time, they're like, I never heard anything like that before. Well, now is the time to hear it. And when you hear that, you realize, oh, wow, then that is a sin. And that's why a lot of the stuff that they uh, put in their stores they would realize that they're sinning doing that. The stuff that they put in the billboards, the stuff that men or women are dressing up nowadays, it's sin. Well, what's wrong with the way that I dress? What's wrong with putting that up? You're so puritanical, you know? Why would you lust just thinking about that? It's because the verse said that if you have lust in your heart, that's already adultery. Now, if you committed a hundred adulteries, what does that make you then? That's pretty serious in God's eyes. You have so much STDs in your heart by now. See? All right, 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Observe another standard for the seriousness of sin. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 15. Nobody committed murder here, uh, hopefully, right? <laughs> Don't raise your hand, please. <laughs> but, well, the brother already said it ahead of time. See that? So, another one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. And people say, well, I didn't commit murder. But you'd be surprised how many murderers are in this room. First John chapter 3, verse 15. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. You ever hated somebody? That emotion is not love, but it's hate, isn't it? You know what that is? That's murder. That's called murder in the heart, just like adultery in the heart. We have to see how God sees sin, not how man sees sin. Because man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh where? The heart. So, a lot of people don't inspect their hearts. When you start inspecting the heart, then you'd realize what a filthy, rotten sinner that you are. And you think God will let you inside heaven that way. Now, 1 John 1. 1 John chapter 1. Another good verse. What you will prove right here is that people or everybody has broken the Ten Commandments, at least three, I would say, at least three. And here's one of them, 
one of the Ten Commandments is thou shall not bear false witness, right? Well, I never lied before. You ever? Some people say that. If, if people actually say they never lied, then 1 John chapter 1, verse 10 says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a what? Liar. And his word is not in us. Uh, you look at verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Well, I didn't sin, then you just lie. <laughs> That's what the verse said. So everybody is a liar then. So everybody here is a liar. Everybody here is a liar. So what's that? God's standard, not my standard. Not your standard, it's God's standard. This is how he defines sin here. This proves how serious God takes sin and how he views sin differently from everybody. And these are five powerful verses that you can use to prove that everybody has sinned. If you come across somebody who says they didn't sin, use one of these five verses. Romans 3.23. Romans chapter 3 and then verse 23. The next one is sin is coming short of God's standard. Sin is coming short of God's standard. So what defines sin? Because the Bible says so. We looked at so many verses. There were five verses that we looked at that pointed out all unrighteousness is sin. That pointed out, therefore to him that knoweth to do good, but doeth it not. To him it is sin. The verse that says you hate your brother, then you're a murderer, and a murderer hath no eternal life abiding on him. You lust someone, you committed adultery in the heart. Everyone lied. Because if you say that you have no sin, but because you do, hey, you're a sinner. If you don't, then you're a liar. Everybody is a sinner. because The Bible says so. And boom, we saw verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, 4, and 5. Now, we're going to look at the coming short of God's standard. Uh, let's look at the text. Romans 3, 23, the Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So, everybody has clearly sinned against God because they fall short. If you are not 100% perfect as God, that automatically makes you a sinner. If people understand that, then they'll see the weight and the seriousness of sin. If they ever criticize you about some kind of Christian moral code that you're living by, then you have to realize you do have verses to prove it. If you don't know how to explain to someone why you can't do a certain thing because it's sin, well, you have no excuse if you look at those five verses and after today's teaching. We have to think about what does God think to be holy and perfect. When you keep concentrating that, it doesn't matter how many PhDs some professor has, you will always have an answer to fire back at that person. Because that person will go by intellectualism, relativism, philosophical sayings, whatever he can, some smarts to go around it. But see, he's using his humanistic moral codes. See, it doesn't change that fact. And you always want to answer that person, that's your point of view. That's your opinion. See, you're defining sin all the time. But me, I've used the scripture, I'm using the Bible, and I'm only going by what the Bible says, what God defines sin. Well, how can you say that's sin? I mean, that's just so extreme. Don't you think so? See, when they give you a trick questions like that, don't agree. Of course, when you think so, it's extreme. You have to say, what does God think so, right? So always retreat to God. And I don't care how smart that liberal relativist or that atheist or that agnostic is, you will be able to answer all the time. So always strictly fit in God's thinking what he thinks and defines sin to be. If we think that sin is coming short of God's standard, sounds very extreme. In a lot of things in life, we have to realize if there's something that's high and lofty as God, 
they will obviously have high standards. You can have a prestigious university that allows a minimum GPA to be 3.8 for transfer students to enter. And it doesn't matter how many more A's and B's the student makes compared to C's, it still won't meet the standard at times. Doesn't matter how hard you worked, how many sleepless nights you went through, how much you sacrificed and how much money you pay for it, or how many good works you do, or how many works you do for it. Doesn't matter. The university, if it's going to maintain its prestigious, high and lofty ranking, it's going to maintain that standard. But if it compromises in some way, then it fails its standard, and there's going to be a competitive university that's going to be higher than it. So God cannot do that, lest there be other gods that will compete and be higher than him. God re absolutely refuses to. He is higher and more lofty than all the other gods combined. Amen. And he will refuse to meet up your needs, your demands, poor you, poor you, if he's going to sacrifice his holiness. He's going to maintain that respectability, that dignity that he is. Not just he deserves, but he is. He is itself. Amen. So you can say that you've done a lot of good and it's just one meager sin. But you won't be able to enter that prestigious university up there. Absolutely not allowed. Psalm 71. Psalm 71. So we saw Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short. See that? Short of the glory of God. Absolutely not allowed into heaven. Well, how can you say that? My dear old grandma died and she's such a very good woman. I can't picture her going to hell. She prayed and she loved Jesus. And, you know, it is hard to answer that. But when you only look at God's point of view, it's a very simple answer in spite of the emotion that's in there. The simple answer is, you don't meet up that standard. All right, Psalm 71, and then verse 19. The Bible says, Thy righteousness also, O God, is very high. And when the psalmist says very, that means very. Who has done great things, O God? Who is what? Like unto thee. No one. No one is. Do we understand this yet? Absolutely no one can meet up to God's standard. So you have to be convinced that you are a sinner. Psalm, uh, not Psalm, Isaiah 64. Isaiah chapter 64. Like I told you, it doesn't matter how much you sacrificed, how many good works you do. But it's so extreme, sin is so extreme to God that do you not realize that all the good is considered to be unclean itself? Basically unclean as sin. Unclean as sin, all the good that you've done. Now you might say, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, that's what God says. He considers all the good things that you've done in your life to be just as unclean, just as filthy probably as sin itself we consider sin to be filthy and dirty that's easy for us to say but can you view the good works that you've done to be filthy and dirty that's hard to do we feel like we deserve something for the hard work we've done out of love for the lord we all think like that now uh what will help a lot with your christian walk <laughs> with your humility and with stop whining and complaining is to realize that all the good that you've done for him is supposed to be filthy anyways. <laughs> and you better be thankful to God that he would take it as something precious and would reward you for it. You might say, why is that? Because if Jesus Christ didn't die on the cross for you, made you holy and perfect, all your works wouldn't have counted for anything in God's sight. It's only because of that. That's why the good that you do will count something precious to him. But you got to realize if there was no cross, all the work that you did for him today, listen, you can 
come to church here faithfully. You can be a King James only, Bible-believing, dispensationalist, sacrifice a lot for Jesus Christ, but it would just be as filthy, just like the murderer down there. Do we comprehend that? That's hard for us to comprehend. I feel like a hypocrite and lying to you saying that. Why? Because these are not my words. This is God's word right here. And then my feelings and my words oppose it to a T because it's bound by this humanistic culture. We've been programmed and brainwashed. We live too long in this wicked world that we lost sight of what real holiness is and how serious sin is to God. We can see that everyone falls short of God's glorious standard, and that's why, because of your sin, that's the key problem. It doesn't matter how many good works you do or how religious you are, or you can give the best of your money to the Lord and sacrifice good jobs just to serve Him, and you can be as moral as you can, but it will never reach God's holy standard. It's still very pitiful, and... Where you still end up is the same devil's hell as Adolf Hitler and other murderers are at. We cannot comprehend that because our human culture and our human understanding has uh, made us very much opposed to God's standard of holiness. If we look at Isaiah chapter 64 verse 6, but we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousness are as what? Filthy rags. Now, we're not going to cross-reference that, but do you know what those filthy rags are? We're not going to cross-reference that, but it's very disgusting. It's very disgusting what those rags are. It's supposed to be some kind of cleanup or covering for your dirty parts. That's all I'm going to say. Your righteousness. But when I read the Bible and pray and give glory to him, shouldn't that be a sweet incense? No, it should make him puke. If it weren't for Jesus Christ who died on the cross and gave you his righteousness and made all that count. You're completely contradictory to uh, God's standard of holiness. All right, go to Romans chapter 3, verse 10. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. Listen, a cockroach is still a cockroach, and a cockroach can uh, give as much uh, of its own nourishment and food to you as much as it can, but it'll still be something that you won't eat. It's still something that'll make you puke. Well, a cockroach is a cockroach, and the efforts, the best efforts that a cockroach does is still filthy and dirty. How much more debase are you compared to God's point of view, who's smaller and more disgusting than a cockroach in God's gap and point of view? We don't understand that. We don't understand that. Do we realize how filthy and low that we are that um, we don't deserve anything? That we are very blessed what we have now and that much is enough and we should be content and happy and thank God and we should serve him till our last dying breath. Now Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, it's going to point out that that's why no one is righteous. It's, after all this, this should prove once and for all no one is righteous. No one can be perfect enough to go to heaven. This is how serious sin is to God, that even the good things you do is considered filthy to God. That's how serious sin is. And you think you can play with sin, you can tolerate a little bit of sin. We have to understand even the good that we do is filthy. Uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Yeah, you're still not understanding. I'm still not understanding. That makes us sinners now. <laughs> Verse 12, they are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. If you have a strong level of holiness and you take sin very seriously, there should be more fear of the Lord in you. But if you hardly have that, that shows how low your standard of sin is perhaps. 
Now, when you look at verse 19, now we know what things soever the law saith. It saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So let's come to the conclusion of the whole matter. When God revealed his holy law to you, that should shut everybody's mouths and make you convinced that we're all sinners and not just sinners. We're really, really wicked sinners who deserve hellfire for all eternity. Deserving of it. No matter how much good you do. Now let's look at Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. The next section is sin is heavily punished by God. Sin is heavily punished by God. Wow. God actually stoned people to death if they were to pick up sticks on a Saturday. That's pretty extreme. You don't know extreme. <laughs> You really don't know extreme. It's a lot more than that. We're going to look at several cases how holy God is that he would give the ultimate capital punishment for it. Capital punishment for things that uh, we wouldn't think that God would do. So it is, uh, you have to be very careful when you play with God. Before you say, well, it's okay if I dabble in this or, well... You know, I mean, my goodness is compromised just a little bit here. Well, I may not be really following the Lord's instruction or will here, but I'm helping God out. I'm trying to do the best that I can for him. So maybe this is fine. You might drop dead. Now, you might go, no, pastor. Let me give you several examples, okay? Acts chapter 5, verse 1. <clears throat> but a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, look at this. Here are people who give much to the Lord. They, uh, basically, how much? If you look at verse 34 through 37, it's supposed to be everything that they own. So they gave a lot of their offering. They gave up basically their income and job, perhaps, their own living, their retirement, future plans and goals, their savings. But there's a certain part that they kept. But still, it's a lot. Otherwise, they wouldn't be bold to say that they gave so much. So when we look at verse 3, notice Peter said, Why does Satan fill your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, the Lord gave him a chance to repent, and he got right with the Lord and gave up everything. No, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all. Let's be, did you keep, keep some part from God? You ever done that? We all think you're a good Bible-believing Christian. A lot of people think I'm a very good pastor. I don't want to park it there. All right. I might drop dead. Okay. Let's look at verse 6. Notice right here, he died. And then verse 7, the wife. Verse 8, Peter asked her, uh, how much did you give? So much. And she said, yeah, we gave so much. Verse 9, then uh, Peter questioned her, how is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then she fell down straightway at his feet. Oh, the poor lady doesn't even have time to grieve over her dead husband. Now, think about this. If you're a family person and you kept back something from God, don't think it's not just going to affect you. You might affect your whole family. Oh, God wouldn't. God wouldn't. I think even without God getting involved, we already see too much destruction already from families who keep back a certain part and it destroyed their whole home. You know how you uh, grow this church? What makes the spiritual backbone of this church, believe it or not? The number one biggest boost is families. Right. Families. More than singles. It's families. If the parents did what's right with their children... What's going to happen is you're already 
uh, you already made an effect that makes a strong church. Pastor and church don't change your household. You can change the church. That's how it works. It doesn't start church and house. It starts with the home. That's where every spiritual problem that's resolved and, can, and spiritual growth and God's blessing starts. It's your house. Now, did you fix your house or are you keeping back part of something from God? Now, 2 Samuel 6. 2 Samuel 6. Now, here's someone who's working hard and helping out God. This is someone who is enjoying a revival meeting and helping out in the revival meeting, bringing in the food and volunteering and then trying to sing a special and help out the pastor and help out the Lord, trying to be a blessing to the guest speaker. And in spite of his uh, good works and best effort, the Lord killed him. The Lord got offended with that brother and sister. What in the world? Look at right here, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 1. So notice that David, he gathered together uh, all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, and accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. And when they came to Nacon, Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. Okay, so see this? This is blowout time. This is revival meeting. Everyone's playing an instrument. They're carrying the ark of God. They're rejoicing. They're shouting hallelujah. They're singing page 67. And one guy, I guess, is a little bit overzealous. A little bit overzealous. And verse 7... God drops that person dead. See that? Why? Something's out of order to God. In spite of the zeal and the passion and everybody feeling heaven. <laughs> That's pretty serious, right? So notice right here that at uh, verse 7 that God killed Uzzah. And verse 8, David was displeased. Lord put a breach. Lord didn't bless the revival meeting. Verse 9, David was afraid of the Lord that day. Oh, so that's where it starts then. What starts the right process is to have fear. If you have fear, then you keep yourself in order. You don't do things out of zeal that can go out of order from God's word. And then when you look at uh, verse 10... So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David, but David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. So now the whole revival meeting is ruined. Just because, not because somebody fought in the church, not because of someone who failed to do a good work, it's because of someone who did a good work for the Lord. So it's great uh, what you're doing to help out the revival meeting or this church, but are you following what the Bible says on that? Is it out of order? You know, uh, if you look at Numbers 4.15, that's your answer why God killed them. Because Uzzah is not supposed to touch the ark. God says no one touches the ark except the Levites carrying it. We have to really check our hearts and say, is this something that God is pleased with? Is this something that's biblical? Is this something that's right? Because it could cost you your life no matter how much good works you do for God. Uh, you know what keeps me in the right? I know that our internet ministry has done a lot of good for the Lord, but you know what? If I don't have the fear of the Lord, see, if I don't have boundaries, if, if I don't have something that holds me back, then what my critics say about me on the internet, they're all right. Everything those critics said criticizing about me, they're right, and actually it's worse than that. 
God knows the heavier criticisms against me. Why? Because out of zeal that I want soul saved people to end up in Bible-believing churches and serve God. See, so I have to check myself all the time. I have to check myself. Is this under your will, God? Because there can be a serious consequence in spite of how much good you're trying to do. Okay, so 1 Chronicles 21. 1 Chronicles 21. So if my critics and inconsiderate pastors out there think that I'm just doing all this just like any typical quote-unquote online or out there, they sure don't know my heart. Only God knows. They sure don't know how much I fear the Lord on that one. Because I fear him as much doing the internet as much as if I were to shut down the internet and do what my naysayers say. I fear the Lord. Not them and not you. I fear God. So he's whatever he instructs me to do. And I strongly believe that one day I that I will get shut down. I have a belief that will happen one day. So because uh, until then, I have to do as much as I can that God has given me the opportunity and told me to do. Because that's the best that I can give for him. And if I do less than my best, then that's a sin. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Don't tell me what to do. First Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1. Now, notice another example, what God did. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people, Go number Israel, from Beersheba even to Dan, and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. Now, it's very harmless, okay? All David wants to know is how many people I have in my military, in my army. Why? Because he'd like to know his fruits. He'd like to know... The stuff that God has blessed him with. Oh, wow, you know, such impressive military might that I have. He liked to know a little bit more about that. I mean, who doesn't admire his or her own work, right? You ever done that? Something you worked hard, something you did well? Who doesn't want to admire that? But notice right here in verse 3, So Joab answered, The Lord make his people a hundred times so many more as they be, but my lord the king, are they not all my lord's servant? Why then doth my lord require this thing? Why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. So Joab knew when David asked him of that, it was wrong. Why? Who wouldn't want to admire someone's work? What's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with that is very simple. It's because of what God said. God, he actually commanded from Scripture that you're not supposed to number the soldiers. He gave instructions on that. But David couldn't help it because he wanted to uh, admire what he got. Now, what's the penalty for that one? Well, uh, after he numbered Israel at verse 5, notice that, uh, and then verse 6, Verse 7, and God was displeased with this thing, therefore he smote David. No. He didn't even drop dead Uzzah here, okay? If you thought Uzzah dropping dead was bad enough, he killed so many people of an entire nation here for somebody else's sin. What's that? That's serious to God. You know how serious sin is to God? If one person sins... He sees that connected with everybody holistically. Sin is so contaminated. Sin is so uh, impure. It's so filthy that it does that. When you keep reading onwards, then if you look at verse 10, 11, 12, 13, notice uh, the penalty for numbering Israel. It's not... Uh, God giving you a simple chastisement. And then you think that your life is so difficult. No, you know what the punishment is? Three years of famine. Or uh, you're going to have your enemies chasing after you. Or a disease that will spread throughout the land and then kill thousands. What happened in 2020? Well, it's simple. Why not say the judgment of God? And why are there idiots saying, oh, preachers who say that, they're just so inconsiderate. How dare they say that? 
do you, do you, did you not read 1 Chronicles 21? We deserved a lot worse after years of sinning against God and what we passed in the laws. <laughs> is very mild. That's right. In verse 14, so the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel and there fell of Israel 70,000 men. And you think after 2020, people learned their lesson. <laughs> no. Guess what? A bigger one's coming. All right, Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. And then we'll look at verse 23. Genesis chapter 3, and then we'll look at verse 23. So uh, in this picture here, uh, this is uh, a painting uh, of the Bible of Ananias and Sapphira dropping dead. And we can see that God, he doesn't play light with sin. I think because we live so much under God's grace and love, we do think that sin is light. So it changed our perspective. God's mercy and grace changed our perspective on how we treat sin. But nevertheless, if you lived under the law of Moses, in spite of the severity of God's law where people get stoned to death, people still see sin as a light issue, don't they? It's amazing. What is in our brains there? What is in our brains there? Uh, we just still don't get the memo. If God gives you mercy and grace, you don't take sin seriously. If God makes the law very strict, you don't take sin seriously. You know, either way, uh, God can bring the millennium on earth, pure, perfect kingdom, and people still won't take sin seriously after that. Now, this is the standard... And atheists have always uh, complained and argued, well, it doesn't make sense how disease, famine, and death, and everything can happen just from simply taking a bite out of the tree. What's wrong with that? I mean, don't you want to gain more knowledge? What's wrong with that? Simple, because you disobeyed and broke God's law. That's what sin is. Did you get that? Stop rationalizing with your human mind what's wrong with knowledge. Would, why would God be jealous of me getting more knowledge? What's wrong with taking a bite? It's just a bite. What's wrong with that? Okay, I get it. Maybe I disobeyed, but I wouldn't spank my child with disease, famine, and poverty, and death just because they uh, broke one rule or broke one standard. How can God do that? Because all of those are within, again, I don't care how intellectual or how reasonable their arguments is, what's the number one weakness still? It's still within a human plane. Comprende? You got to get in God's plane. When you get in God's plane, human's plane is out the window there. Human feelings are out the window there. When you're in God's plane, it's a totally different ball game. It's a whole different world out there, whole different moral code out there, whole different belief. Uh, when we look at Genesis 3, 23, therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now it's so serious that God doesn't want them to eat the tree of life. Why? Because just because of that small disobedience, if they ate the tree of life, then like what a lot of other preachers said, then they could have been um, eternal demons, so to speak. Eating the life, a tree of life, living forever, and then with that sin in them, that's something very serious. So God says, I cannot have my holiness tainted. You got to get out of here. That's how serious it is. Now, the ultimate seriousness, which we all know, um, but before that, let's go to Leviticus 10. Here's another one. Leviticus chapter 10. And then we'll look at verse 1. Now, imagine if God struck your children dead. 
now if your children did not live well for the Lord and God struck them dead how many parents would probably be upset at the Lord but imagine your children if they didn't serve God the right way they didn't worship God the right way and God struck them dead how would you feel toward the Lord because of that human plane right that's hard because of that human plane but we have to understand God's plane here <clears throat> what do you want God to do get out of his plane you sure want that wouldn't you the devil sh would sure want that wouldn't he why then he can't be God then and the devil wins uh, we look at Leviticus 10 and verse 1 and Nadab and Abihu the sons of Aaron took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord which he commanded them not perhaps they were trying to help God out trying to make it better but see it wasn't commanded by God and if it's not commanded by God when he told them to do things that way notice it was very risky business now don't get me wrong not everything has to be in the Bible the things that you do for the Lord I get that but when there are things that are not written in the Bible and you do those things for the Lord do you question them a lot of times that is risky business maybe the reason why God never mentioned it in the Bible is because he doesn't want you to do it so we look at the verse 2 notice what God did he showed mercy on them no and there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them and they died before the Lord then Moses said unto Aaron look at this answer this is it that the Lord spake saying I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me and before all the people I will be glorified and Aaron held his peace what can he say with all those hurt feelings he can't with that kind of an answer because God said I did this to prove a case here I'm holy and this is how I take sin seriously may that be glorified can we glorify that all right Romans chapter 6 and Revelation 21 Romans chapter 6 and uh, Revelation chapter 21 now this is the ultimate price and the ultimate punishment that everybody knows but simply because of who you are a sinner what you've done a sinner the punishment is far worse than just starvation getting kicked out of the garden and uh, fire from heaven burning you up no we're talking about eternal fire that will burn you up for all eternity now that's the ultimate price the ultimate horror the ultimate wrath of God uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 the Bible reads for the wages of sin is death see the price of sin is death but this death is not temporal because the context is but the gift of God is eternal life right. see so it's an eternal death here what's this eternal death Revelation 21 verse 8 you all know that verse but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death see that's the other death that Romans 6 23 is talking about now uh, the common objection that you and I are thinking is very obvious and then we see right here Adam and Eve being kicked out of the garden it's pretty obvious the punishment is really heavy especially when it comes to sins that you and I wouldn't make a big deal about if anybody let's be honest if any human did the things that God did against those people punishing them then we think that person is local and that person is an extremist that person uh, is horrendous a horrible person so I mean that's what we get that's what I get because it's my human understanding but again that's a human plane right we got to get outside of our plane and think about a higher plane what would a higher being feel a higher plane is see no human can do what God does you know why they're not on a higher plane they're just as hypocritical weak and sinful and human and fleshly like you and I 
That's why they can't get away with it. That's why they are mad if they act like God. And God said that the first commandment was there shouldn't be a God like him. So any human who would dare to do the things that God does, God sees that as blasphemy, see? So it is blasphemous if a person does the things that God would do. Why? Because they are not on the higher plane as God. But if there is a truly higher being than us, and a much higher being than us, on a much higher plane, he must maintain that. He must do it. It's not because the punishment is heavy. It's because the highness is at stake. The holiness is at stake. It must be maintained. We don't understand that. We only look at the, uh, the merc uh, how merciless it is, how horrible it is, how severe it is, how cruel it is. But we don't look at the highness, the demand of holiness, that it must be that way. Otherwise, it's compromised, and God is as human as any of us. If there was a small maggot in a big bowl of soup, now, to you and I, you, you know exactly what we would do. Disgusting, gross, dispose the whole soup. We're not going to eat it. But think about it. The maggot's not going to get that. The maggot's going to go, come on, look at all the richness of this food out here that you're throwing away. It's bigger than me in size. I mean, you think that I'm that filthy? I mean, uh, there's so much stuff over here that you can enjoy. I don't get it. Me, I eat stuff from the ground, says the maggot. I eat dead stuff. I mean, who do you think you are, human? You think that you're better than me? You think you're higher than me? Who do you think? You're such a cruel and abusive person. You're so stuck up. Well, it's simple. You're the maggot. That's how filthy and small you are. That doesn't matter because there's a higher being, a higher person that says, that's how filthy it is to me that I get rid of the whole thing. And that's your problem and my problem. See, we don't see how seriously filthy even the small sin is. And if we were to do that, then we would understand a bit more of God's holiness. Even if we don't comprehend it fully, we'll at least understand a little bit more. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. I pray, Heavenly Father, that today's teachings have uh, opened our eyes. It sure made our flesh uncomfortable, Father. And even right now, if I'm going to be honest, my thoughts and my feelings cannot comprehend or wrap around this because I'm human, Father. These are my human thoughts. These are my human feelings. But truth is truth, no matter what I think or no matter what I feel. And the truth is, is that you're higher than us, and your holiness is higher than us, and it must be maintained. Otherwise, you're just as human as us, Father. And I pray, Heavenly Father, we'll realize who you are and how serious your holiness is and how seriously filthy sin is in your eyes that we would clean up our lifestyles. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.